So I'll get this package management in Chef. Um, I'm going to just quickly start out by just saying hi and telling you about where I work and stuff, and then just jump sort of right into the technical aspects of the talk and talking about packaging, packages, Chef, and all that good stuff. Um, these slides are available right now on um, my uh, company's blog, just at blog.packagecloud.io. You can go there and follow along on your computer. There's going to be a couple like sort of Chef and code examples that might be kind of hard to read on the screen. So if you want to check them out online, you can just grab them right now. Um, so hi, I'm Joe. Um, I think lots of things are cool. Here's a list of things I think are cool. I think uh, computer programs are pretty dope. Uh, reproducible builds and infrastructure. Uh, automation, configuration management. And last but not least, uh, Tadig. And I realized when I was practicing this talk that you know, my friend was like, oh, what's Tadig? Is that like a new operating system or something? And I was like, no, like, Tadig is actually a rice dish. If, you, if any of you guys ever had Persian food, um, there's this rice dish called Tadig, which is amazing, so you should try it. Um, it's top five favorite things after computing. Um, and I, so I work at a company called Package Cloud. And um, what we do is Package Cloud makes it easy to just upload, download, store, and delete software packages. You should use it. It's pretty dope. Um, and it's sort of a perfect companion to Chef Delivery, which was announced uh, yesterday during the uh, you know, initial keynote at ChefConf. So you should check out Package Cloud. And we have an enterprise version that you can run sort of like in your own infrastructure and behind your own firewall. It's at enterprise.packagecloud.io if you want more info about that. Um, so I'm just going to skip that. So the, um, okay, so this talks about packages, right? And the question is, is you know, wh why talk about packages? Like, who cares, right? Like, everyone knows what a package is. Everyone knows how to install packages. Like, why are packages important? Uh, it turns out the packages are really central to, you know, maintaining, building, and testing infrastructure. Packages are a primitive in Chef. Um, understanding where packages come from and how to store them properly is sort of a requirement for infrastructure of, of any size whatsoever. Um, packages and patching, packaging themselves are actually much trickier than they seem. And I'm sort of going to go over sort of like a lot of the caveats of setting up your own package management systems internally and like lots of default options that people usually don't enable because they don't know they exist and, and stuff like that sort of, uh, you know, as we go on in this talk. So the overview of the talk, I'm just going to talk about, you know, what is a package, uh, what is a package manager. Um, this sort of common pattern you see uh, sometimes in, you know, chef recipes or just on the internet of people running configure, make, make, install. I'm going to talk about, like, why people do that, why it's bad, why you shouldn't do that. Um, some open source tools for creating package repositories um, and sort of, um, you know, explain how to, ha how to manage, you know, package repositories with chef. So first, start with the basics, right? Like, what is a package? A package generally consists of metadata that has stuff like, you know, version information, architecture, dependencies, stuff like that. Um, the files through into the file system, right? So if you're installing, like, the package for Nginx, it's going to include the actual Nginx binary and other files. Um, and there's sort of a couple different, you know, common package types. The first package type that most people are familiar with is a package type called RPM. And, you know, an RPM package is, you know, they're used on CentOS, Arhel, Scientific Linux, Fedora. Typically have the .rpm file extension. And they can be inspected, installed, removed with the RPM command line tool. And RPMs are actually sort of really interesting. They're actually a, a header structure, which contains just binary header data, sort of fixed on top of a CPIO archive. So if you ever need to extract an RPM, but you don't actually have RPM, you can actually use like a really tricky combination of DD and CPIO to actually extract the files in an RPM if you need to, because an RPM is actually just a CPIO archive. Um, if you need more information about you know, all the different uh, switches you can pass to RPM, you can just check out the man page. There's a ton of information there. Um, this talk is more about like the package repositories themselves, but the packaging, the packages themselves are also interesting and important. Another common package type is Debian package type. Um, Deb packages, you know, they're used on Ubuntu, Debian, Nopix, and other sort of Ubuntu and Debian derived Linux distributions. They typically have a .deb file extension, but if you're using Embedian or I can't remember the exact, I think it's Embedian or Debian or something like that. There's a udeb package format, which is the same thing, it just has a different file extension. Um, and they can sort of, they can be inspected and installed, removed with dpackage, which is a really useful command line tool. The packages actually are AR archives. And it's an AR archive containing a version file, but it's not the version of the package, it's the version of the Debian system that you're, the Debian package format. Um, there's a, a data tarball that actually includes the files that are going to be written to the file system when the package is installed. And there's a control tarball. This, con this includes like all the metadata about the package, like the version, uh, the architectures it supports, the description, the maintainer, sort of that information. Uh, Debian packages can be GPG signed, but GPG signatures on Debian packages are never checked. Uh, we're going to talk about this later, but this is sort of like a really, really common misconception about how Debian packaging works. 
Um, and there's, there's different types of GPG signatures, and I'm going to go more into depth about how the GPG signatures work and why they're never checked and why it's kind of useless. I mean, a lot of people will say, like, oh, download my GPG key to verify these Debian packages. Well, it turns out, like, it doesn't actually do anything. Um, I'm going to talk about that momentarily. Um, you can find out more options about dpackage by just checking out the man page um, for, for dpackage. Um, and so there's, you know, lots of different package types, right? There's Ruby gems, NPM, Java, Python, all kinds of different package types for different uh, programming environments, different operating systems. Um, some packaging systems also have this idea of a source package. So RPM has sort of source RPMs, and Debian packages have <coughs> uh, source packages. And so what is a source package? Well, typically, a source package consists of, again, metadata, like the version, the architecture that the source can be built on, build dependencies, stuff like that, and source files, like C source, C++ source, Python scripts, bash scripts, whatever. Um, and th what they do is they allow you to rebuild a binary package very easily. Um, and source packages are just super, super useful if you're trying to debug some like, really weird production issue, right? Like you're running Redis or something in production and like it's seg faults and you want to know, you know what exactly happened. Well, <clears throat> one way to figure that out is to like, actually go and install the source package. And what that'll do is that'll unpack the source for the thing you're running and apply all the patches that were applied by the maintainers of the package for your operating system. And then just leave the source hanging out on the file system so you can go and inspect it and read it and sort of track down exactly what's going, what's going on. Um, I use this a lot when debugging you know, production issues um, on our service, right? Because like, I want to know exactly how, you know, whatever, how, exactly how like, libssl was compiled or whatever. So I'll, and I'll go and I'll install the source package. It'll apply all the patches. And I can see exactly you know, how, this, how this thing was built before it got installed as a binary on my system. So source packages are super useful. And you should definitely use them uh, if you need to debug something. Um, installing packages with Chef is really easy. You just use the package resource. You specify the package name. And boom, you can install it. You know, it's a couple lines. You can specify the specific version of the package you want to install. Like in this case, this is installing a specific version of uh, Zlib. And in this, this version string, actually, um, this is sort of a, a kind of a, an ugly point of packaging. But uh, a lot of people get confused by the colon. If you, if you notice, like in the version string, there's a colon at the beginning. What that means is that like, the version after the colon is the version that the upstream maintainers produced. So like 128 is the version of Zlib. And the number before, the one before the colon, is actually what's called an epic. And this is sort of like a hairy wart of packaging where you know, sometimes upstream maintainers release packages with version numbers that don't make any sense. Like there's a package, uh, there's, I think it's like LaTeX or something that uses digits of pi as the version string. Um, and that just makes no sense. Like, uh, like apt and you know, yum and other packaging systems like, can't, can't understand like, if a specific version is greater than or less than another version because they don't do floating point math when computing version strings. Um, and so to solve that, they added this thing called an epic, where you, as the package maintainer, can maintain your own versioning system on top of the maintainer's versioning system if they're using some weird you know, digits of pi or, or whatever. Um, so anyway, packages are a collection of files with metadata. Uh, metadata usually has information like you know, CPU architecture, version, dependency information, and a lot more stuff. Um, and installation is easy if you don't have any dependencies. right? You can just run like RPM. IVH and install a package, or dpackage dash i install a package, and you're good to go. Um, but you know what happens if you have dependencies, right? Like it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. <clears throat> um, and you know, as I just said, installing one package is really easy. You can just run you know dpackage dash i your file name or rpm ivh. Um, of course, you should actually be using Chef or some other automation to do this instead of doing it manually. Um, but you know, what if your program needs other programs, right? Like for example, nginx, right? It depends on libssl or, or zlib or you know a bunch of other libraries. Um, you end up with a lot of packages you need to install yourself, and it's just really, really painful to you know, go through and sort of corral all the dependencies yourself. <clears throat> so the solution to that is a package manager, right? But you know, what is a package manager? How do they work? And like, why are they important? Um, well, a package manager is actually a collection of software that allows you to install, upgrade, or remove packages. Um, you can query package information from your local system or from remote repositories. Um, some tools include more advanced features like mirroring or caching or, or other interesting things like that. Um, there's sort of a bunch of like really popular package management systems. Um, a popular one that you know, a lot of people use on Red Hat-based systems is YUM. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of YUM. YUM actually is an acronym for the Yellow Dog Updater, comma, Modified, which I think is a pretty weird name. Uh, it's common on RHEL, CentOS, Fedora, and other RPM-based distributions. Um, and you know, it's used for installing, removing, configuring, querying RPM packages and their associated dependencies. On Debian-based systems, we have a system called apt. Um, apt is another acronym. It's the advanced, the advanced package uh, tool. 
And it's common on Debian, Ubuntu, Nopix, and other Debian and Ubuntu-derived operating systems. Uh, it's used for you know, just installing, removing, configuring, and querying Debian packages and dependencies, similar to YUM on RPM-based systems. Um, so when you install packages with Chef, right, like Chef will automatically just detect which package manager you should be using, and it will just you know, do the right thing for you. You won't need to worry about which command to run or what options to pass or whatever. right? Like Chef takes care of all that for you, so you should be installing your packages with Chef and not directly on the command line. Um, you know, package managers, you know, just to summarize, we just, we just talked about, you know, package managers help you install software and associated dependencies. They easily, you know, can easily remove, upgrade, and query packages. And Chef will automatically detect the system's package manager when you install a package and do the right thing for you. Um, so now we're going to enter sort of like a slight tangent. I'm going to tie this back to like why package management and repositories and all this stuff is, actually matters. Um, so, okay, like I'll present a problem, right? So, okay, you run Ubuntu 10.04 LTS in production. You want to install Redis. Uh, Ubuntu 10.04 comes with Redis Server 1.2.0. And it's pretty old, right? Like maybe you need 2.8.19 or 3.0 or whatever. You just need something, you know, much more recent than 1.2. So what do you do? Um, a common solution to this problem, it's not a great solution, but it's a solution that, like, you see a lot of people do. Like if you, I, I've seen, like, lots of gists passed around on GitHub that have um, something similar to this. And I've seen, you know, I've talked to other people who do something similar to this. Um, a common solution is just to like deal with this by building Redis or, or Ruby or whatever thing you need on your system, um, just directly from source in your Chef cookbook. Um, so like this, right? Like I don't know. I've seen something similar to this, um, and I know people who have built stuff like this, where it's like, oh, I'm just going to compile Redis and then install Redis. And like on, on the face of it, like it, make, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, like I, I know how to run, you know, make, and I know how to run make install, and I know how to use Chef, so like I'll just do this and like get Redis, and I can just continue with my day and get on with my life, right? Like, why bother dealing with finding a new package for Redis, or why why bother dealing with like actually building a package for Redis, right? I can just do this. Um, and you know, people do this. The reason why people do this makes perfect sense, right? It's really really easy to do. Um, just dot slash configure, make, make install, right? And it works, right? Like. I run those commands that like the Redis readme tells me to run or the, or the Ruby readme or, or the whatever readme tells me to run and I run it and then I have like that program on my computer and everything works, right? So like who cares, right? Why do I need to do anything else? And I'm using Chef, right? Like if I build out a recipe that just compiles the thing in Chef, like everything's reproducible because I'm using Chef, so this is dope. Like why would I do anything else? Um, but there's sort of a bunch of uh, conditions that sort of crop up if you ever need to, I don't know, like if you ever need to completely uninstall Redis or libssl or Ruby or something else you're compiling from source, like if you need to completely remove it, like, then what, right? Well, uh, you know, you need to install a security update, you need to install a new version. If you need to install the same exact Redis on 200 machines and you don't want to recompile it on every single machine, um, well, lots of, like, sort of bad things fall out of this, right? Um, not all make files have uninstall targets, so I don't know if any of you have run into this, but, like, I've, like, run, you know, make install on, you know, a development VM and, like, just had files just, like, spewed out on the file system. And then I'm like, okay, cool, I don't want this anymore, so make uninstall, and then it's just like, oh, there's no uninstall target. It's like, great, like, I now have like a thousand files in different directories, I don't know where they are, I don't know how to remove them, I don't, you know, I don't even know what any of these things are. Um, and that's really painful if you have to deal with that, right? And if you use that previous install method of just running make, make install, you end up with just files just sort of splayed out on your file system, and there's just like no real easy way of removing them if the make file has no uninstall target. Um, <clears throat> Leaving artifacts on the file system can cause really, really, really hard to debug problems later, right? So, like, imagine you install libssl or something, right? And it just, like, you know, spits out all these files all over the file system. You try to uninstall it, and, you know, for whatever reason, there's no uninstall target, or the uninstall target doesn't work, or whatever. And now you have, like, a bunch of just, like, shared libraries. Not all of them, but just, like, a few of them, like, in different directories, like, in different load paths. And then you install, like, a new version of libssl, but it's, like, partially linking to, like, old versions of stuff. And, it's just like really, really painful if like artifacts get left on the file system. Um, and you know, build processes can change version to version, right? So if you if you encode all of your build processy stuff in your chef recipe, and then like the build pro like someone switches from using, say, like, you know, auto tools to using like scons or CMake or something, you now have to like figure out how to encode all that stuff in your chef recipe so that you can like go and rebuild this thing from source. And it can be really, really painful to roll stuff back if you need to. Um, and the other problem is, right, like, rebuilding the same source does not necessarily get you the same byte-for-byte -byte binary every time you build it, right? So if you need to build Redis and you build it on 200 machines, um, you're not going to get, you may, but it's, it's, uh, it's unlikely that you're going to get the same exact byte-for-byte -byte binary on all 200 machines, even though you're compiling from the same source. And this is actually an area of, like, open research. Like, the Debian people are actually working on this idea of byte-for-byte -byte reproducible builds. Um, 
And there's a lot of reasons why this is complicated, but uh, it, it, it's not currently possible, right? Like if you, if you build the same source on different machines, even if they're running the same operating system, you may not get the same binary out the other side. Um, and if the binaries aren't identical, right, you can end up with bugs in some of the compiled binaries, but not others. And then it's, you know, just painful to recreate source builds inside a chef, right, to include all this logic for running CMake or running scones or running whatever inside of a chef uh, recipe or cookbook. And it makes writing tests for cookbooks really painful, right? Because like if you're compiling Ruby inside of a cookbook and you want to test that cookbook, then you need to wait like 75 hours for this thing to compile so you can actually run your tests. <clears throat> um, and so what you should do is you should make a package. And if you make a package, that means you'll be able to install the same binary in every machine. Um, when the package is removed, all the installed files are also removed. Uh, versioning of the build process is sort of built in with the packaging system um, with most tools, right? So like for Debian tools, right, like you have an actual rules file that has all the build steps encapsulated in the package itself. And then you get to keep your, your chef cookbooks and your recipes and all that, just specifically about config management. You don't need to sort of like mix building your software with your configuration management because it actually makes sense for these two things to be separate in my opinion. Um, and your build steps are actually completely factored out into your, into your package and your configuration management just stays in your, in your chef recipes. And then your, your new chef recipe, instead of having like make, install, and configure, or whatever, is just like, you know, package redis install, and you're, and you're good to go. Um, and you, yeah, like I was just saying, you know, your, your build stuff's getting encapsulated in the package itself. Uh, makes iterating on the build, you know, more straightforward. So if you need to adjust something or change compiler flags or whatever, you can just do that and then rerun the build for the, for the Debian package or for the RPM without having to like, you know, potentially apply or converge, you know, a whole bunch of cookbooks or bring up a whole bunch of nodes. Um, so, okay, that's cool, right? Like, Maybe you're convinced, maybe you're like, okay, you know, I kind of get it, like I should write a package, I don't want, you know, artifacts from previous builds all over the file system, right? So, um, you know, how do I make a package would be sort of a, the next logical question. Well, luckily there's a bunch of tools for doing this. Um, the tools are all really, really painful to use though, so it's sort of like a trade-off, but um, the, the common tools for this are th tools like dev build. So dev build is a, is a tool for making Debian-based packages. There's RPM build for making RPM-based packages. Git build package, this is sort of like a lesser well-known tool, um, unless you're a Debian maintainer. Uh, Git build package like, helps you make Debian packages from Git source trees. So if you, know, you work on something with Git and you want to build a Debian package, you can consider using Git build package. It's, it's pretty useful. Um, the documentation is basically non-existent though, so um, I don't know, your, your mileage may vary. You can use FPM, FPM is sort of like the new, the new thing that a lot of people are using. Oh, of course, there's Omnibus, the, the chef project. I think Omnibus actually uses FPM in the, in the background at the end of the build process to grab all the artifacts and output an actual package object. And there's also sort of Mock and PBuilder, which are much more advanced package building systems. So what Mock and PBuilder do is Mock and PBuilder will generate uh, a CH root of the operating system that you're building the package for. And so anytime you do a package build, the package, so, so Mock is actually the, the CH root system for RPM packages, and pbuilder is a CHRE system for dev packages, and, but they both work similarly. They both create a, sort of a clean room environment for doing a build, and then the build for that package happens inside of that clean room that mock or pbuilder are managing. And the whole point of this is that like, you want to make sure that given sort of a, a fresh installed operating system, right, that your package is going to compile properly and will have the proper dependencies laid out and everything um, you know, from just like zero. And so mock and pbuilder are really, really useful. Um, Last time I used them, they, the documentation for both of these was incredibly poor, and you know a lot of it was stale. So um, it's it's worth the struggle though. Like it's worth actually like putting through it and like learning how to use mock and pbuilder. So if you're doing package building right now as part of your release process, because you sell software, because you make packages internally, um, you should definitely take a look at mock and pbuilder. Um, I promise it's worth like the investment in like time and, and energy. Um, and like I was just saying, you know, there, there's trade-offs, right? Like it takes time to learn new tools, um, and it takes time to understand packaging. And you know, no one ever has enough time. Like that's like the one thing that no one ever has is time. Uh, but um, you know, once you learn how to make packages, you can build reproducible infrastructure much, much more easily. You can test. You can use your production environment in development and test, which is like a huge, huge thing that I'm going to talk a little bit about next. Um, and you can more easily build tests for infrastructure with Kitchen CI, right? Like, say you need Ruby to run your whatever your app, or you need Redis or, or whatever it is to, to run your app. Uh, if you you know, build the package instead of building it as part of uh, your chef recipe, you can actually just reuse that same package. You know, if you do your development in Vagrant, like, I don't know, I do a lot of my development in, in a Vagrant VM on my Mac laptop, and, you know, I want to run the same Ruby and the same Redis and the same whatever that we use in production, and so we have packages for all the versions of everything we use, and I can just install all those on my VM, and now my VM is running, like, the same byte-for-byte -byte binaries that 
I'm running in production, and so it makes like debugging and stuff, um, you know, much less painful. So okay, like you know, you're convinced, right? Like you're like, okay, yeah, it makes sense, right? I I want to remove, you know, I want to make sure that when I uninstall a package or when I upgrade a package or I install a security update, that the stale files are going to be removed properly. Um, I know, you know, now I know what, what tools to check out, you know, dev build, or RPM build, or Omnibus, or whatever. So now it's okay, cool. So like, I have all these packages that I just built for infrastructure, right? Like, how do I store and organize these things properly? Um, well, to do that, you create a package repository. And uh, major Linux distributions keep repositories of their packages for their users. Um, so for example, Apple, which is, uh, if you use, you know, RPM-based systems, if you use like CentOS or RHEL or whatever, you might be familiar with Apple. Um, if you're not, Apple is just like a package repository that has a bunch of tools that don't come default in, uh, in Red Hat and CentOS. Um, you know, Ubuntu and Debian also have their sort of official package repositories and like their security update repositories. And you know, you can sort of store a package and its dependencies uh, in a package repository to make it easy to install them all in your infrastructure, right? So if you install Nginx, it'll pull in all of its dependencies for like libssl, zlib, whatever, and you know, install it all in your infrastructure nice and easily. And to you know, create a repository, you can do that using a bunch of tools. Um, so to create YUM repositories, you can use a tool called Create Repo. Uh, for, for app repositories, there's a tool called Rep Repro. And there's many other free tools available for generating package repositories on your systems. Um, you have to read the documentation carefully. There's lots of tricky options. I'm going to sort of go over like how to use these tools, what the tricky options are, and then sort of like how to enable the options you need to enable to actually have secure package repositories. Um, and there's like a lot of really, really tricky things, especially around like GBG signing and SSL and stuff like that that I'm about to get into. So we're going to go over some examples uh, now to get you started. <clears throat> so you use CreateRepo to generate YUM repositories. Um, to use CreateRepo is pretty, pretty straightforward. You just create a directory. Um, you can copy your RPMs into your repository, and then you just run Create Repo, and then it will output a bunch of metadata, and your repository has been generated. After you've generated the metadata for the repository, you need to run this last thing at the bottom here, this GPG detached signature um, generation. And what this does is this actually signs the repository metadata. Um, this is an option that a lot of people don't really know too much about. It's not very well documented. Um, you don't really see many package repositories actually using it. Um, and GPG is important. Um, you know, using GPG to sign the generated repository guarantees that you generated the repository, right? It means that you know, some outside person, like a man in the middle or something, they didn't come in and just you know, generate a package repository metadata that points to bad packages um, you know, in between you know, your customer and, and yourself. So signing the metadata is actually really, really important. Um, and yeah, it means that no one else you know, modified, removed, or inserted a package into the repository other than you. And uh, it's, you know, like I was saying, it's not, it's not very well known, but it's incredibly, incredibly important. And this is not the same thing as using RPM sign or RPM dash dash sign, right? So there's two separate types of GPG signatures. There's GPG signatures that involve the packages themselves. So you can actually sign the packages themselves. And you can sign the metadata of the repository. Um, and those are two separate signatures that you need to generate. And so if you want a secure YUM repository, you want to sign the repository metadata with GPG. You want to sign the packages themselves with GPG. You can use RPM sign or RPM dash dash sign or whatever. Um, serve the repositories over SSL. And then enable all the right options for SSL verification, repository GPG checking, and package GPG checking, and SSL certificate about, uh, verification and everything else. Um, so I don't know. Like If you're like me, you look at this, you're like, oh, this is dope, right? Like, Wouldn't it be really dope if I could do this all with Chef? instead of doing this manually, like instead of manually tapping out a config file, like it would be really dope if I could just somehow get this done with Chef, right? Um, well, there's good news. Uh, you can. You can actually use Chef to do this, which is dope. So um, you can use Create Repo via Chef. There's um, uh, this cookbook that I found in the Chef supermarket called uh, Yum Repo Server. You can just install that, and this will help you create your own Yum repositories using Chef, so you don't need to worry about using Create Repo on the command line or understanding any of the crazy command line arguments for for create repo. Um, here's just an example, right? So um, this is pretty simple. It's just going to create the repository, tell it, you know, specify a directory, give it a remote source, and a list of packages to pull into the directory and to, and to be indexed by create repo. If you'll notice from the last slide when I was talking about signing the GPG metadata, so, uh, and I was talking about how that's not like a very well known option and all that. So this 
This cookbook, this Yum repo server cookbook, um, doesn't actually do the repository metadata signing either, because it just doesn't know the, that you're supposed to do that or that that even exists. And so you need to, you know, GPG sign the repository metadata yourself. Um, and also, you know, I'm, you know, if anyone's interested in trying to get involved in like an open source project, right? Like one thing you could do is you could, you know, fork this uh, this cookbook, the Yum, the Yum uh, repo server thing, and just like modify it to actually do this internally instead of needing like a separate execute resource. But just to, you know, just to keep going with the example, right? Like you'd create a repository using using that cookbook from the supermarket, and then you would need to actually run like an execute resource to actually go and you know do the signature on the on the metadata itself of the repository. And then once the repository is created, it has to be added to the client machines. And it turns out that adding a repository to a client machine is not that easy. Um, a lot of people think that all you need to do is just copy and paste the file into Etsy, you know, Yum, Repos D, or whatever, just on your machine. And, boom, you have a repository. Well, it turns out that there's actually a lot of options that need to be specified in those things, and usually those options aren't specified properly. Um, so you can use Chef. Chef will actually allow you to set all the options you need to set. So you can use this Yum repository resource. Um, and as you can see, like on the, on the third line or the fourth line down, there's a GPG key where you can specify the URL of the GPG key to use to verify signatures. And then the next two options after the GPG key there are options that get confused very regularly. So there's GPG check, and then there's also repo underscore GPG check. So GPG check is uh, set to, so in this example, I'm setting them both to true. And so that first option, GPG check set to true, that means check the GPG signatures of the packages, right? And then the second option, repo GPG check, means check the signature of the repository. Um, and the second, op these options like often get confused, like which one does what, what does repo GPG check even mean? Um, so if, if you're using, you know, if you're serving up Yum repositories for your customers, like if you're a vendor of software or something, and you have people installing your agent on their machines or, or whatever, um, you should definitely look at whether or not you're doing, you're doing the metadata signing. And um, if you're not, you should do it. And then once you do it, you need to make sure to tell people to actually enable repo GPG check, um, set that equal to true. Uh, the easiest way to do that, obviously, is with Chef, but you can also do it just manually by tapping out a config file and just, you know, installing it on your machine. You also need to uh, set SSL verify to true, because on CentOS 5 slash RHEL 5, SSL verification is disabled by default. Why? No one knows, just is. Um, and you also need to specify the location of the uh, SSL certificate bundle, because that also doesn't exist on, I mean, the certificate bundle exists on CentOS, but um, for whatever reason, like, the default value is not specified on CentOS 5. This is actually fixed on newer versions of CentOS, but I would just recommend just, like, you know, being defensive and just setting SSL verify to true and like hard coding the actual path to the certificate bundle, um, because verifying SSL certificates is actually, you know, it's really crucial to actually delivering, um, you know, bytes over the internet securely. So you should definitely do that. And as I was saying earlier, you know, most people never turn on repo GPG check, SSL verify, or set the certificate path, but if you have a Yum repository, you should definitely be setting all the options that are shown in this example set to true and, you know, setting explicit paths and getting everything lined up, because you just, you know, you just need to be defensive, because you just don't really know, like, how, you know, how an operating system is going to change over time and how defaults might actually accidentally get reversed or, or whatever. But that's not all. Uh, so once you get your repository set up properly, you need to get it installed on the client machines. And the only way the client machines are going to verify GPG signatures is if you install PYGPGME on the system that's going to do the verification. Without PYGPGME, Yum will not actually be able to verify signatures. Um, and a lot of versions of CentOS and RHEL do not actually automatically install PYGPGME with YUM. There's an open bug about how PYGPGME is not a dependency of, uh, of YUM, and it should be, right? Because if you have YUM on your computer and you want to install whatever, Redis, Ruby, whatever, you want YUM to automatically go and verify signatures on the repository and the package. Without PYGPGME installed, that just won't happen. It'll just fail silently and just do the installation as if nothing's wrong. Um, that's obviously really bad. So you definitely want to install PYGPGME. And if you're a vendor serving up Yum repositories, you need to encourage your users to also install PYGPGME so that your users can actually do the verification process. Um, because otherwise, like I was saying, like Yum will just let you install a package without doing the verification. It will just fail silently, and everything will just continue as if nothing bad happened. And so you know, if you're configuring your client machines uh, and they're using Chef, you can just you know, install PYGPGME really easily using Chef. And so now I'm going to move on to just explaining like some of the stuff about RepRepRo and how to use it for app repositories. RepRepRo has a lot of similar sort of issues around security um, and like caveats with GPG and SSL and everything else as <clears throat> as you know Yum did. Um, it's just like a really really like GPG is just a really really complicated thing, right? Like 
I know a lot of engineers who use GPG and uh, use GPG for like email or whatever, but and a lot of people sort of miss um, underestimate how complicated it, it actually is to use properly. Um, so anyway, so using rep repo, you just create a directory. Um, you know, you create a config directory underneath that directory, and you create a file named distributions that goes in the config directory. And you add, you need a bunch of fields. So in this example, um, I'm just you know making a repository for Ubuntu Precise. Um, Components, in this case I'm using main, but in general components are just like a high level way of sort of segmenting different groups of packages. Um, main is sort of a common one to use. You just need to specify the CPU architectures for the repository. In this case I'm just showing, you know, 32-bit, x86, and 64-bit. And then you need to use signwith. And um, what signwith is, is signwith is, um, you know, so I'll get into signwith in a second. So, you know, you can add more sections if you need more names, right? Like if you need packages for Lucid or for Trusty in addition to Precise, you can add additional sections to your distributions file. The sign with actually specifies the GPG key that you need to use for signing repository metadata. Uh, and you specify the GPG key ID. And to get the GPG key ID, you can look at the output of GPG dash dash list keys. It'll list the GPG key ID on the side. And you take that GPG key ID and you put it into the distributions file as like the sign with thing to use. And then when you run rep repro, it'll generate the repository metadata and then sign it using that, using that key that has that key ID. And this is not the same thing as using deb sigs or deb sign. Um, si similarly for RPMs, right? Like I, when I was talking about yum and, and, rep, and uh, create repo and RPM sign, right? Like GBG signatures are generated for packages and for repositories. They're separate, separate tools, separate workflows, and they have separate meanings, right? So for rep repro, having the sign with set is not the same as using deb sigs or deb sign. Deb sigs and deb sign, those sign the actual Debian package. Um, whereas sign with in the rep repro config file signs the metadata. Um, and when you sign a Debian package, it's actually never checked. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you currently sign your Debian packages um, and you've never set up like an XML policy file on your Ubuntu machine to do the verification of those signatures, then those signatures are never being verified. Um, there's a blog post on the Package Cloud blog that explains more about how to actually build up the proper XML policy file to enable signature verification, but Suffice it to say that like no one has done this because finding documentation about like what the XML policy file even needs to look like is basically impossible. Um, so if you're using deb sigs and deb sign, like you can keep using them, but just know that like it doesn't do anything for guaranteeing the authenticity and the um, the origin of of the Debian package itself. So anyway, to import packages, you can just run rep rep row, you know, mention the uh, the distribution you're importing it for and the file name, and then you know, boom, you have a package repository. Uh, but wouldn't it be cool if you can just do all that stuff with Chef instead of doing it manually? Um, and you know, the good news is, is that you can. Um, Chef can create app repositories for you. You can install um, this cookbook that I saw in the Chef supermarket. It's a cookbook called Rep Repro. Um, actually, one of the Chef guys, uh, Josh Timmerman, is the one who wrote this, uh, this cookbook, and he's sort of the maintainer of it. Um, and it sort of works based on data bags. I mean, this example is too hard to see, and there's just too much data there, and, and you, know, you guys are too far away. But if you look at the documentation for uh, Rep Repro, the the, the cookbook on GitHub, it showed an example of like all the data bag settings you need to have and what path you need to set to actually generate uh, an app repository yourself. Um, and you know, once the repository is created, right, it needs to be added to the client machines, the same way that once we generated a Yum repository, it needs to be added to the client machines. And you know, adding an app repository to the machine is pretty easy. You can just use uh, the app cookbook, which is also in the Chef Supermarket, um, specify the repository, the architecture, distribution, the GPG key there down at the bottom, and uh, <clears throat> you're good to go. Um, but that's not all. There's also sort of another trick. You need to have apt-transport-https installed on your system if your repository is served over HTTPS. Um, this package is not installed by default on many Ubuntu distribution, on many versions of Ubuntu. So if you added a repository to your system that's served up over HTTPS, and then you tried to install a package either manually or with Chef, um, it will just fail if you don't have apt transport HTTPS installed, and it will just give you like a really cryptic error message. So you definitely want to install apt transport HTTPS. And without that, you can't install packages over HTTPS. So you should definitely want you definitely want that installed in your system. Um, you can do that really easily with Chef. You can just use you know package resource, boom, install the package, and you're good to go. Um, and so okay, cool. Like we've arrived. We've like done everything we're supposed to do. And like you know why? Like you know what is the result of all this hard work and all this pain and understanding all these options? Well, now you can use KitchenCI to test your infrastructure. Um, you can determine if the packages you need are actually installed after your cookbooks have run. Um, you can determine if the repositories you added are actually added after your cookbooks have run. 
And you don't need to wait forever for Ruby, Redis, and everything else to build during a test run. But best of all, you can now run Chef in your development VM using the same cookbooks you use in production. And the cookbooks are applied, and you're running the same exact binaries you also run in production. And it won't catch all your production bugs, but it'll make, you know, it gets you much closer to the production environment that you're building for. And uh, just having a you know, similar development environment, having a development environment that's similar to production is like, just super, super useful for just debugging purposes. Um, so anyway, the summary is you know, creating package repositories is tricky. Make sure you GBG sign repository metadata, since basically no one does. 99% uh, of package repositories get the metadata signing portion of this wrong. So carefully read the documentation of create repo and rep repo and try to use uh, the chef cookbooks when you can. Um, and make sure to install all the necessary libraries on all the client machines for verifying signatures and accessing repositories over HTTPS. Because if you don't install PYGPGME for RPM systems and you don't install app transport HTTPS, you're dead in the water anyway. <clears throat> and over serve up repositories over HTTPS. Just good practice to do that. Use Chef to automate all your infrastructure. And if remembering all these options is too painful and you don't want to deal with getting all the right, you know, PYGPGME stuff installed or setting all your settings right, you should just use you can use PackageCloud.io to help deliver your software. Um, and that's it. Uh, you know, thanks for uh, sitting in and listening on this talk. And I don't know how much time I have for questions, but if I have any time for questions, I can take a question or two about um, packaging or package repositories or whatever. Yeah, we got about four minutes. So anyone have a question they would like to ask? Got one over here. I just had a question about how Package Cloud either augments or um, somehow makes this process better. Um, yeah, so uh, Package Cloud just provides like a generic API over all the packaging systems, so you don't need to worry about like what command line options to run to generate a repository for um, app repos or RPM repos or RubyGem repos or whatever. You just upload a package and then our backend generates the metadata for you. And then we actually provide a chef cookbook that you can give to people who use your software. And that chef cookbook will go and install the repository and it will also install PYGPGME or app transport HTTPS and get like all the GPG options and everything set up and installed properly. That way, you know, your consumers of your repository don't need to worry about, you know, do they have the right thing installed or not? Because um, I've, you know, I've, I've worked at companies that, you know, we were selling software and we were telling people just, you know, copy and paste this repository configuration file, you know, and in the config, you know, GPG check is enabled, but, you know, none of the client machines were actually installing PYGPGME, so, none of our customers were actually verifying the signatures. And this is like a problem that a lot of people who host RPM repos have. So, um, you know, just in short, what Package Cloud does is Package Cloud lets you not have to worry about any of this because we sort of build all the tooling and all the infrastructure and the chef cookbooks and everything else you need to get your, your customers up and running so you don't have to worry about what options to enable and stuff like that. Do you have, do you have any advice for executing a yum downgrade in a recipe? Um, Painful. Um, I mean, you, you can specify the version. I, I guess it depends on like what package specifically you're you're downgrading. Um, did you have like a, was there like a specific incident that happened? Is that why you were trying to like do a downgrade or something? Uh, the uh, yum provider will, or rather yum, will uh, refuse to install version one because you already have ver version two, two installed. So you have to go back and uninstall that newer ver version. If you could just do the uh, downgrade, it'll take care of it, but. It so, yeah, so that's interesting because you usually can do downgrades. Um, you can actually specify the version number you want with yum. I don't know, I've, I, I've actually done downgrades on yum, so it could be that there was a bug in the in the packaging script or something for the package? I, I don't know, like I, I've, done, I've done downgrades successfully before. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe we could talk about it after. Maybe there's like some kind of bug or something in, in the packaging. But I know that when you do upgrades or downgrades, if there's a bug in like, you know, the post RM or, or, or pre-install uh, scriptlets in the actual spec file, uh, the, the downgrade or upgrade could fail. So I don't know, maybe it was something related to that. I don't know. All right, I think we have time for one more quick question. So my team has a variety of different applications that are in tarballs, um, and we simply extract them. There's no build step in it. It's simply when we go to deploy it in Chef, we extract the tarballs. And so the question came up, should these really be packages, or should we just extract them as tarballs? And so I guess my question to you is, if you were to convince my team to uh, put the effort to 
convert those to packages, what would your arguments be? Um, my argument would just be that converting them to, uh, so it, it sort of depends on like it, whether they're compiled binaries or scripts or, or whatever, but um, in, in general, like the main reason why I think that packaging is a good way to do it and why it's worth the effort is just for the guarantee that when you do an upgrade or a downgrade or an uninstall that the, the actual artifacts on, that were installed will actually end up getting removed properly. Um, and it's possible that you could build your own tooling around tarballs to do that yourself as well. Um, it just sort of depends on like how, I guess like on the culture of the company and like sort of how much tooling you have built up around using tarballs. Because I know people who do deployments based on tarballs and they have a lot of tooling built up to you know, specifically remove um, you know, files that are, that are being pulled in by the tarballs. I, I guess like the advantage of using packaging is just that like that's already taken care of for you, so you don't need to build that again. And um, you, know, you can sort of share shared libraries between uh, other, other things on the system, right? So like if you have, you're deploying some application, it depends on you know, libssl or whatever, and you also are deploying other things that also depend on libssl, then like those things can all know that you already have a version installed and they can all communicate properly. Um, and I don't know, I, th I think it's just, it's just tough to sort of mix and match like different deployment, like di sort of different delivery systems on the, on the same system, right? Like if you start doing like make install on a system that you've been doing yum install on before, uh, you just need to make sure to like set your paths properly and just make sure, and like you know yum won't be aware of the other things that you've installed manually like outside of like the yum workflow and so you know it, it just it just really depends like it just really really depends on specifically what exactly it is you're deploying but um, it's it's useful because like you know knowing that you've installed a, a library or a program that something else might depend on is just like a is a good guarantee because then any other thing that's also running that needs to use whatever it is that you get, that you unpack in your tall role can just know that that exists on the system and use it without you know, using a different version or, or, or you know, downgrading it or, or whatever. All right, uh, we're out of time, so thanks everyone. Cool, thanks guys.